Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit 82 Cafe at 82 Steinwehr Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house and have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your visit. Check them out at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options and their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order. That's 82 Cafe at 82 Steinwehr Avenue across from the Dobbin House or raggededgerc.com. Audiobook narrator, Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. The 1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of uh, Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. We are talking today with uh, a new guide to the show. Uh, Jason Heilman, and we're talking about uh, it's uh, things that make you go hmm hmm, 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 hmm during the, during the Gettysburg campaign. Um, Jason, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Matt. <laughs> it's your first time on. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for accepting the invitation. Sure. You know, you never know. You, you, you sometimes you want to invite somebody, and then you do, and then they're like, no, just flat out no. And, you know, so it's always nerve wracking when I extend that invitation, but I'm glad you took it. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself before we uh, get into the subject at hand here. Yeah, all right. So uh, I'm not a licensed battlefield guide full time. You're part time, but you are a guide. I am a guide. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No no false advertising. (laughs) It's like, oh, God. (laughs) All right. I I got licensed in the 2015 exam got the license in 2016. And when I was going through that process, uh, my wife and I, we were, what happens if I pass? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Because I got a job. Right. And uh, they were offering the weekend license at that point. And so that was the uh, the fallback position. Okay. I'm just going to move I, this out of your face sure, there. Yeah. If, yeah. If, that, uh, if I go, if I get through this, I'll just have to do it on weekends. And back then, uh, COVID has put an end to, for right now, the uh, tour requirements right but for those first few years you had to you had to meet those tour requirements 45 and 45 tours a year which as a part-time guy as a, as a weekend yeah yeah so you got weekend you got part-time then you got full-time Ooh. and so i was the weekend so the 45 okay i think it's 45 90 like 180 okay the tour requirements for those three but um since covid hit you know there's no tour requirements sure yeah but uh so um yeah, I work my normal job. I'm an electrical engineer. Oh, okay. I work for the utility. Doing one of the uh, smart power, people. Power, power company. Yeah, mm-hmm. I pretend to be. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I've been doing that 31 year career. So the the whole concept was, uh, you know, I really love American history, Civil War history, yeah. retirement. Yeah, yeah, it's a good retirement yeah, gig. Keeps yeah. you busy, keeps you active. Just enough. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What I like about it is some people say, are you staying busy? As busy as I want to be. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. A, it's good to do it to the degree you want to do it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Keep it enjoyable. And, you, and you're liking it so far. Oh, yeah. I oh, yeah. It, yeah. Okay. What is your, if you had, uh, if people said to you, like, what's the one thing that you love to talk about regarding the Battle of Gettysburg? Your one subject, your one whatever. I really like the farms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I did. I, I, I've completed one research on uh, the Moses McLean farm. Okay. But but that whole the history of the land, whose farm it was, you know, I started asking questions shortly after I became a guide. You drive down the Emmitsburg Road, and you've got Sherfy Farm over here. You've got Klingle over here. Where's the property lines? Like, mm-hmm. Whose field is that one? Yeah, and I'd be, I'd ask some guys, you know, like where's the dividing line between uh, Henry Spangler and and uh, Sherfy? Sure. 
I don't know. Why you need to know that? Well, then you got the Rogers Farm too thrown yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. Then you got the Rogers Farm. Yeah. Well, where's the property lines? Like I can't picture it in my mind. What do you need to know that for? You know, but because I want just, it, just impresses across my mind because I grew up in a rural area of Western Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and your land, your farm, that's that's what you care about. Sure, I mean, those farmers, it's I mean, your life. That's, that's everything. That's yeah. your life, and you always ask permission. You know, I'm a hunter and. You always ask permission before you step foot on somebody's property. So I'm always interested, like, whose property is this? You know, is this, this person I need to go ask there or whatever. But uh, I like the farms, then linking it to who was there at the time because so many of these farms, they're owned by somebody, but that's not who was living there. You know, mm -hmm. There's got these tenant farmers, you know. And um, then what happens during the battle. And then I really love linking in all those decades after how yeah. to become National Park. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there's a whole storyline after that. Sure. You know, and, uh, you know, linking it into what we call battlefield today. Right. Yeah. That's uh, kind of along the lines. I, I'm, I'm kind of becoming more obsessed with uh, old roads, park roads yeah. or farm lanes or whatever that and how they went. And, you know, like by the Trossel Farm, uh, the, 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 the road there used to be a little more to the south. Yeah. And, you know, and now it's the horse trail. Like, yeah, I just think yeah. that stuff is cool. That's cool. Know? Yeah. And, and, and then when you get to that, the, the history of it and the history of the park, and then you find out, well, that's the way the fifth core mm -hmm. headed toward the wheat field, you know, or the second core. Yeah. Know, that's the way they came. Then the light bulbs go. Ah, yeah. yeah. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's that not, I mean, it's very close to what it was in 63, but it's not, of course, what it was exactly right. in, in 1863. So it's, uh, the, but there's evidence of what it was there if you know where to look and you know what you're looking for. That's right. And then not to mention the park roads, you know, like, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, was it Webb Avenue up uh, by the angle? Yeah. Right? The, the the loop there? The loop that went in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the, the straightaway below that um, by, uh, it was the Harrow's Brigade plaque that's facing yeah. the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff fascinates me. You think it's facing the wrong way today? Today, I, I just did. We yeah. were we were doing a walk on uh, monuments, and I had the, an old picture of the U.S. Regulars Monument that they just restored. Yeah. yeah. And when you look at that monument and how it has stairs uh -huh. down, down both yep. sides, you know, why would they put stairs down toward the other? The stairs there to nowhere. Was roads on both sides. Yeah. That was between two roads. Right. It's designed that way, and when you see the picture, like, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, but it's easy if if you just visit the battlefield in the last twenty thirty years. These are things you don't you, know, you don't think you of. Don't, yeah, you you, don't think, you of. think it was always this way. It was always yeah. this way. like Little Round Top. They used to be able to drive your car right up there, right up on the summit. You could drive Ch your car Chamberlain Avenue, come yep. right around. You know. Yeah, are they gonna put that back? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not putting. It's, it's just gonna the, be walking. Track. Yes, it's just walking up there. Uh, from what I understand, they're shoring up what we already have and. <laughs> and hopefully uh, formalizing some of the uh, social paths because uh, yeah. I think those are important. All right. Well, so today we're talking about uh, things that make you go hmm mm -hmm. hmm in the <laughs> in the Gettysburg campaign. This was this was your idea, and it's uh, I like it. It's a good idea because you know it's different. It's just different from what we normally do. We usually stick with one subject, but yeah. uh, today we're going with a theme and we're going to uh, see what we can do. So uh, let's start with the first one here. You mentioned uh, Stewart's Ride. And this one confuses people. No one really... Uh, this came up the other day. I forget who I was talking to, but they were making such a big uh, thing out of it and everything like that. And uh, I, I tried to explain it to them more, but even I got confused. And I've talked about this a million times with people who know better than I do. And I understood what they were saying. Uh, but uh, somewhere along the lines, I, I gave up and just changed the subject. I was also, we were also having drinks. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, it was a fun weekend. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so go ahead. Stuart's Ride. Uh, why does this make you go, hmm? So, yeah, hmm. Stuart's Ride. Hmm. 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 Uh, because <laughs> it, it has such. So many, so many different implications to it. And um, what has always, you know, what, I, what I've often thought about is when this concept got brought up, and, and from what I've read, it's, it wasn't just Jeb Sturt. James Longstreet yes. had this idea. In, right. in fact, uh, it, you know, you read different accounts. 
he may have suggested it first. Right. You know, and then we always get into the psychological analysis of Stuart, you know, was he reeling from, you know, Brandy Station, you know. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Reassert himself, uh-huh. you know, and so we're getting into Re- a psychology. Reclaim his glory. Yeah. yeah. So we never put that part of the story in that James Longstreet might have been the person to bring it up. But um, Well, now, before you go further into what you're saying here, yeah. why don't we why don't we give the people back home who maybe are not really well versed in yeah. in Stewart's ride what was the purpose the stated purpose when lee said go boy go what was what was the purpose of it the the purpose um w- would be to get between the union army and washington dc uh, and if you look at it on the map you know you got to the west in the shenandoah valley lee's movement mm-hmm. across maryland into pennsylvania and you've got this trailing Union Army of the Potomac. They've got to stay in that defensive position to the east. Right. Cautiously guarding the approaches to Washington, eventually Baltimore, and if we got to keep going north, Philadelphia, etc. Mm-hmm. They're the guardian army of that. The, the concept of this was, okay, loop around their tail to the south, then ride between them and D.C. Okay. Cutting communication lines, railroads, it's it's got a it's got an element of um, deception, so you know let's throw them off and because you got to remember, Union Army has no idea what what's Lee doing, what's his intentions, where's he headed, you know what's sure. the, what's this campaign uh, for. So you get in between there, you cut their communications, you give them some disruption, you give them some deception, with the caveat. You got to complete your ride. You got to get around the tip of that movement. Right. And renew your primary job, which is screen and provide the intelligence on the Army of Northern Virginia's eastern flank. You got to renew your connection with us. Yeah. So that we can talk. You, you're our eyes. Right. So to me, that sounds ridiculously risky. Yeah. So that's what that's what I always come back to. Okay, regardless of who brings it up, but Lieutenant General James Longstreet, Jeb Stewart, and you've got this idea. To me, you got to think about what's the risk reward in doing this. Mm-hmm. What does it add to this campaign to cut some telegraph lines, disrupt some supply lines, do whatever? We you talk about not to get into fantasy football, but you talk about <laughs> making your picks, right? What's the ceiling yeah. and what's the floor okay. in this pick? Okay. How, how good could it get and what's the worst it could get? So you always assess what's the ceiling and what's the floor. And when I look at this, that, that part of this campaign, th- I can't think that the ceiling's that high. That's what I'm going to say, yeah. That doesn't win you a battle. That's no. not going to, like... And it's not how long is that going to delay the union for? Yeah. Like, what's the best ultimate result you could get from that how great could it get and then you look at how bad it can get and that's the that's the reality we live in with the campaign is it got bad it got bad but it didn't get worse it like it could have been Stuart was completely wiped out or it, it, or captured or whatever it, but useless you could to lose the that yeah. asset all those assets for, not even not, not forget about the men just Stuart himself you could lose Stuart yeah. if you lose all those men yeah and uh and, 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 you know, as I've been made to understand it, what, you know, when we, when people say, well, Lee didn't have any cavalry here and we, we going to, well, that's not true. He did have yeah, cavalry. Yeah. It was Stuart that he was lacking. Yeah. Stuart's um, ability to collect and analyze and distill information and report it to Lee. Yeah. That's what Lee was lacking. That's what he was missing. That's what yeah. he needed. And he didn't have that. I mean, to me, that's very real. Like, I would have flipped it around. I would have had like, all right, if I'm just going to go cut some telegraph wires and, and, you know, confuse the union, I would have sent the two brigades that I left on the Potomac, send them to do it and keep Stuart with me. I, if, why, we, if we lose that, I mean, yeah, who cares? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Beverly Robertson, yeah. Yeah, yeah. his John first name is Beverly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? You know, Let's yeah. get rid of him. But that, that's the other aspect <laughs> of it. Not only did Jeb Stewart do it, he took his three favorite best performing uh, uh, brigades, brigades, yeah, with him, right. And left the scraps. Which I can understand. Like, well, you can have the rest. Yeah. (laughs) I can understand Stuart's thinking there because it's like, oh, well, this is a risky operation. I want my good guys with me. Yeah. I understand that. But from Lee's point of view, I'm I'm like, I don't get why you would get rid of Stuart. 
And, you know, and, uh, and but but the whole premise for Lee is the the trust in Stuart. Uh-huh. Now, now don't forget, he's ridden around the Union Army twice right. already. That's true. You know, so he's done this before uh, successfully. Um, is, is the trust that he will reconnect with us just inside the Pennsylvania line? But, like he'll be able to complete this circuit. Let me let me take so it. He's not like saying I'm going to lose Stuart. I don't think that entered into the equation. Uh, okay, but let me let me uh, just argue that with you a little bit. The first time he ran around the Union Army, where was Lee's army? Yeah, the the first time he did it was a, a peninsula. Yeah, yeah. So Lee's army was Richmond. Static. Static. City. Right. Yeah. Lee's army here is on the move, and the Union Army is between Stuart and from the get go is going to be between Stuart and Lee. Right. 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 And Lee's army is moving further away from Stewart. So it's a much riskier operation than the first time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, Lee had to have been like, he he had to have figured, oh, I could lose Stewart and all these men and horses and everything else. He had to, because he's not stupid, right? So, But he must have weighed it and said, well, the reward, whatever the hell the reward would have been, is far outweighs the risk of losing Stewart. He had to have. Yeah. No? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, because you keep, I keep coming down to there had to be or was there is this a failure of Lee to not evaluate this enough from the concept of what could go wrong or yeah. was his trust in Stewart so high that it will never go bad like mm-hmm. this won't go bad. This guy's the best of the best. He's going to pull this off like he's done it any other time. And he maybe he didn't spend enough time saying, yeah, but this time we're moving. The Union Army's moving. Right. There's, nobody's static here. Right. Now you're going to try a ride with all these moving components of it's, both armies in a constant movement, not knowing where each other is and, and their feeling for, for each other. Did he even spend enough time thinking about that? Like, the, what you just brought up? I don't know. Or did he? Or how? Stewart is so good; it's just how about it'll go off without a hitch. How about he? You know, he's got to um, he's got to get not only behind the Union Army and and cause some havoc, uh, but he's also then got to surpass them and get up ahead of the head of the snake, right? Yeah, get across the head of the snake, right? Get back. Well, how do you know where the head of the snake is going to be by the time he gets there? Because it's moving too. If you think about it, too, in the concept of, of the campaign movement, the the Army of the Potomac's already established itself as moving quicker than any of them, mm-hmm. the, the Confederates, believed that would occur. Right, right. And, and it continues to do so. And, and that's what trips Jeb Stewart up. Yeah. Is his numerous attempts to, to ride back to the West. Not he, he keeps running into it. Yeah. I always, people always like to press us, you know, what do you think he should have done? And one option is call it quits. Yeah. Go back around the tail. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're a fast mover. Right. Just call it quits and get, say, this isn't working out. Go back the way you came. Go around the tail. Union Army's going to continue moving north. Right. They're not going to spend going the power you. of their army coming back south after mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Go around the tail, catch back up. Um, you know, relieve the gaps and, and, and get yourself back in connection. You know, so. so what is it Stuart able to accomplish as he's doing this? He cuts, he cuts some communication lines. Um, you know, he captures 150 brand new U.S. Army supply wagons at Rockville, uh-huh. which he makes the, another bad decision to actually keep those. Keep them, yeah. So those encumber him now. Mm-hmm. Now you got a, you got this wagon train. That you're trying to bring along with you, it's going to in some way affect your pace. You, sure. You're not; they're not able to keep up. He's worried about what's in the wagons. So we got supply. We've got the wagons themselves, which is of value. The the uh, mules and horses that are pulling them. And uh, he, and wasn't the he values that enough that he doesn't want to just burn them and move on. But what weren't the supplies that were in there um, mostly feed for horses? Right? Is that right? Uh, yeah, at least some. Or a good chunk a, of it was. A good was, chunk right? of that is of value to him. Yeah. yeah. So you would need that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, um, but why is it uh, a thing that makes you go, hmm? Hmm. hmm. So, hmm. By the way, that's uh, hmm. Joe from Peach Orchard Publishing in the corner running the cameras and going, hmm. These are, hmm. Hi, Joe. Hi. <laughs> it's very seductive. All right, go ahead. Why because does it make you go? A, because it ends up being so impactful in numerous ways. Um, uh, 
the the first and foremost is Lee has no idea where the Army of the Potomac is to the point where he finds out from a spy mm. um, that mm. the Union Army is north of the Potomac River. And one of the interesting facts I like to throw out there is what is the one body of either army, Union or Confederate, that crosses the Potomac River in the Gettysburg Campaign? What's the last element to cross? Jeb Stewart. Mm. 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 That gives you some indication. Right? The Union Army's cross the Potomac. Yeah. He's the, the last. Okay. So, so the, yeah, they're moving faster than they expected. Than he, yeah, yeah, than him. And, um, and so, A, number one, Lee doesn't know where the Union Army is. And, you know, you see it in the movie, but it's in all the accounts that everyone he's running into is, where's Stuart, where's Stuart, where's Stuart? Why is it vexing him so much? It's the lack of information. Yeah, okay. That's what's lacking him. It's not just missing his buddy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's the tangible. There's yeah. something tangible he's looking for from that cavalry, yeah. and that is information, and he doesn't have it. Then when he finds out from a spy, this is where I always point out, the initiative flips in his mm. campaign. He had the initiative. He's dictating the movement. The Union Army's reacting to him. They're chasing him, trying to figure out what's going on. And now when he finds out this information, he is now reacting to them. Okay. By definition, the initiative of this campaign starts to swing. Uh -huh. Okay. Now his actions are dictated by theirs. Got it. Okay. You are now within one day's march of intercepting or uh, in, in involving yourself in the middle of my scattered army. Now, I've got to take measures based on where what you're doing, the opponent. That's initi the initiative's changing. You know? Right. And so that's A number one. Um, and then the, the, the next one that we'll get into is then the movement toward Gettysburg on July 1st is a reconnaissance. Yeah. Why is a mass of infantry doing reconnaissance? Right. Because of lack of cavalry. Well, let's get into that then. Right. So the next thing is uh, Hill's advance uh, on day one, Heath's division. Um, and so, as you say, it's a reconnaissance. Uh, and, w I mean, that wouldn't need to be done if there was more cavalry there. But there was cavalry within summonsing distance of Lee. Um, uh, not, I'm not even talking about Jenkins. I'm talking about Beverly Robertson and Grumble Jones, that, right? They, yeah, they, they were left in the valley guarding caps. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, all these issues are complex, right? Yeah. Lee's got to own a part of the lack of the cavalry input because he made choices. Right. The choices were to leave Robertson in the, in the valley. And Bowden to the west, and then send Jenkins with the tip of his advance toward Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. um, your entire right flank is absent cavalry, right? Because you believed Stuart would be there, yeah, right. So he made these choices with the assumption this will come off without a hitch. Ugh. As it's not coming off without a hitch, now to your point. Do you get replacement? You got to pull somebody out of the valley, get up here. You got to pull, pull Jenkins off the lead element toward Harrisburg. Right. Really? Right. Is there any danger up there? No. Do there, you really yeah. need that, leave, that body of Leave cavalry? one of his regiments behind and then bring the rest down to Heath or yeah, something. I yeah. think the closest like reaction for me would be get Jenkins off of Yule. Yeah. Get, get him back down this way. Mm -hmm. Get him out to the east and, and let's get some scouting going on. Um, so that that's what I think. And Lee's got to own a part of all this because he's making all that decision. I think Stewart's off doing his thing. Now, what are you going to do with the rest of your cavalry that you have? Uh -huh. um, you know, cavalry comes through Gettysburg uh, July 26th with uh, Early's advance. Right. You know, got the um, 35th. The, 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 yeah, the uh, White's or, Comanches. White's Comanches come through. So there's cavalry in the area. But they're leading some advanced elements of infantry mm -hmm. on their foraging, you know, right. They're not doing the larger scale, go check out the Union Army and get us information on where they are and what, and what that is. But, you know, the hmm about AP Hill's advances, okay, it's reconnaissance. Two divisions? Artillery? Yeah. 
Yeah. That's quite a reconnaissance. We, we to say, it's a reconnaissance in force. In force, yes. Really? Hmm. Okay, you have the orders do not get into a general engagement. What do you need two divisions for? Well, and the day before, <laughs> you sent one brigade, and the guy comes back and says, hey, there's yeah. Yankees out there, yeah. and you don't believe them, but see... It tells me that they maybe they were erring on the side of caution, but at, maybe they believed. Well, okay, right. this isn't what we're getting from Lee, but maybe he's right because he was just there, right? Uh, and he's been around long enough to be able to tell, and he's surrounded by officers who can tell, you know. So maybe he's right. Let's send the whole division in tomorrow. But my whole thing would be, why? Why do you need to send the whole division, and why can't you just stay where you are? Right. And send, you know, maybe send another brigade or just a regiment, whatever. Send something up there. And in Buford's report, they know each other are there. So Buford's within a couple miles of, of Hills Encampment out mm -hmm. of Cash Town. Mm -hmm. There has to be some knowledge at this point. That, that each other are there. Uh, some some level of cavalry, right? That's what I never really you know, got. Because so it's how like, you this not? is foggy. Yeah. This is real foggy. Yeah. Why, why are we marching, not one division, but two divisions? We're taking artillery with us. Yeah. On a reconnaissance, just to, just to clarify right, the right. sit. We're, get, we're getting the situation clarified. That's a, that's a pretty powerful uh, opportunity there. It, but, but, you know, it may be in Heath's defense, or Hill's defense, or whoever's defense, if they did know that Buford was there, that a whole cavalry division was there, um, maybe they wouldn't have all come down the same road. Maybe they would have come via the Fairfield Road or something to like split up. Yeah, right. Splits to two have you know a half of the division go down one, half of it goes down the other, um, in case it's true. Yeah, and we don't want to get bottlenecked on this one road, so let's. I think that's a fair analysis because if you think about it, if you're looking at it and you're second guessing, we're not getting all the facts from you because we've got the AP Hill, you know, shoes report. Right, right. The, the Heath. <laughs> it's, yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. But we I thought there was a supply of shoes in the town. Mm. <laughs> Joe, is that a hmm. Hmm. shoes? <laughs> is if you, if they really thinking about getting into a fight? Yeah, wouldn't they do that? Yeah. You've also got the the. The uh, cut around to up to the Mummersburg Road. Like, uh, yeah, like early, honestly, you could have like three early, roads. You, you yeah. could have had three approaches. Yeah. If you want to really take a tactical advance on it yeah. uh, and you really think you're getting into a fight, I think that's a fair logical analysis of it. Of, well, I don't know that they really believed they yeah. were going to get into a fight. So maybe they, they really didn't believe that they were going to get into a fight. Maybe right. they really didn't believe that it was, you know, the Army of the Potomac and they thought it was local militia or something. Yeah. Or maybe, or, or, or maybe it's a little Heath. bit of Union cavalry, but it's not much. Right. And we'll just brush we'll it back. We'll just brush it aside. Yeah. Or maybe Heath is not the military genius that I just proved that I am. That's, yeah. Hey. So right. there you go. Hmm. 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 Matt <laughs> no, Matt is not. <laughs> but uh, that's what I would have done if I were in Heath's shoes. There you go. Split, you know. You're all headed in the same place. Yeah. It's come by different approaches. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, so that's why it makes you go hmm because mm -hmm. just the short, just the, the short sheer of it. size, the size of, of the, the advance yeah. that Hill chooses to send in the direction of Gettysburg on the morning of July first. Given the information that we believe he had at, at when he had it, mm -hmm. you know, hmm. hmm, you send that much, you know, got uh, Heath and Pender. Coming down the road there. All right. Well, then, what about uh, now? You, another first day thing that makes you go hmm is Rhodes Division. What makes you go hmm about that? Hmm. hmm. So, Yule shows up. So you put him up at the top of Oak Hill. He's looking down the landscape, and by you know coincidence, by circumstance, Yule realizes I'm going to show up on a Union flank here. They're all they're all aligned to the west here. Right. Looking at um, our, our colleagues out here on um, Hare Ridge, I'm going to land on a on a um, flank. Officers' intent, a military officers' intent would be if the boss was here, knowing what we know, we believe he'd want us to attack, win, right? Right. Because you can't. It's, it's hard to create this situation on a battle. Yes, and here it is. It's, perfect. It's, it's going. It's 
right. you know, just due to the circumstances, we're going to land in the right spot. Yeah. We can't pass this opportunity up. Um, but we could get off on the subject. Isn't that interesting? Yule's willing to do that, but then we're going to talk about other, hmm, you know, mm. on other topics. Yes, yes, yes. So, so it's a great idea. You've got an, you've got an opportunity now. And they wreck it. They ruin it, right? So, you, and, and and you talk about you. You got what is it? Five five uh, brigades. Six, five or six. In Rose Division. In Rose Division. What do you have? Daniel, Daniel. Ramser, right. Iverson, O'Neill, and Dulles. Dulles. Five. Yeah. Five. Five. Mm-hmm. Pick the two worst. <laughs> pick, pick, pick the two worst. Pick the two worst. Right. Iverson and O'Neill. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you think about the rest of them. Dulles. Probably one of his most trusted. Uh huh. You know why would he put him out there on the, on his flank? Right. Because uh, you, Cause you, you trust it. Yeah, trust yeah. you. And, and you got order of march, which order of march coming on to any conflict always comes into play because it just happened to be the randomness of how we mix up who's creating dust and who's eating dust. Mm-hmm. You know, and we got to balance the dust. Good, is, just explain what you mean by that, so people that aren't aware of what you're talking about. So order of march, you, you take your organizational chart of the army or. Anything, the right. brigade, the division, the army, and the order in which you leave camp, who gets to leave first and be on a clean road? Mm-hmm. Who's next, who's third, who's fourth, and who's last? Everybody back that line is eating literally the dust kicked up by everybody else. And right. you've got to deal with the traffic jam of the starts and stops. You know, nobody likes to be on a highway when it's just, you know, brake check and, mm-hmm. and then you got to slow down. Do you want to set the pace, be out in front, clean air kind of a thing? They would rotate that. Yeah. You, you're not always in the lead. You're not always in the middle. You're not always last. We rotate it. Okay. Okay. So that's order of order of the march of the day. Right. You know, in the movie, Pickett says, I'm bringing up the rear, you know, for God's <laughs> sakes. Yeah. You know, I'm last. I'm dead last. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Longstreet <laughs> explains to him, George. You know, yeah. Well, shut we, up. Well, if we turn around to head back, you'll be in the lead. <laughs> That's right. He does say that. Yeah. <laughs> if we turn around, you'll be in the lead. But order of march. So when you're coming onto the field, Doles peels off. Then who you got? O'Neill, Iverson. Mm-hmm. Who's coming up next? It's look how they align on your battle map. Yeah. Then you've got Daniel and Ramser. Mm-hmm. Ramser, one of the toughest fighting brigades there. You know, he proves to be the most trusted. Everything. Where's he at? stuck in the back right what do you do hey you guys move out of the way let's bring up the ones with you know we think we can get the job done but anyway the, you know the the let's say the circumstantial way that people come onto the battlefield sometimes has an amazing positive effect right uh you know like iron brigade showing up sure. second brigade out isn't that great yeah <laughs> um, but then you've got o'neill and you've got iverson and then they wreck it they just ruin it. I mean, and you look at all the different things. But they that, ruin know, it or the Union Army ruins it? I think the Union Army does a good job of what you throw at them. But, but you got to look at the Confederates and, and, and Rhodes. Um, uh, the, the breakdown in the communication. O'Neill has five regiments. Right. He uses three. Yeah. One, he thinks, belongs to Doles down on the flat guarding their flank. And the other one, he thinks um, Ramser has responsibility for it. So he actually goes in across Oak Ridge with three. Mm -hmm. Part of this is nothing but a breakdown of communication because, you know, Rose is saying, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, I thought. Well, as soon as we have a, wait, you thought? (laughs) Why are we not talking? Why are we not clarifying these issues? So you've got that whole end of it is what's O'Neill end up doing with what forces he ought to be able to throw at the Union flank. Then you've got the Iverson thing. Then you've got the coordination of each. Those two brigades ought to have gone in there in a coordinated effect to where they are hitting that Union flank on Oak Ridge at nearly the same time. Mm-hmm. Now, if you go up and you stand near the, uh, near the peace light and you look at that terrain... To, to um, give give them, you know, I'll do um, uh, thought here. O'Neill can't see Iverson. Right. The lay of the land does not allow Yes, that. you are blind. That demands 
somebody else coordinate this? Uh-huh. Who, if you look at the organization chart, who would be the person who ought to have taken responsibility to coordinate that? Uh, Rhodes. Robert Rhodes. Yeah. Okay, dude, look at the lay of the land. These folks need some help. Help them coordinate. Iverson needed to step off way before O'Neill uh-huh. to get it timed. Right. If you think about it, in my the way I would picture that, Iverson would need to be past the Forney farm in the swale or getting near the swale when O'Neill needs to get started. Mm-hmm. So that we're going to strike that uh, observation tower, right? Right. right where those monuments are. Yeah. That should be the guiding point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just, Just go, go, where the go for the tower. Are. Go for those monuments. <laughs> yes. At the same time, and that's going to eliminate those first core um, mm. regiments and brigades there f- from doing what they did, sure. which is align, fight O'Neill. Then you've got, you know, the bad luck part of it for the Confederates is the 11th Corps shows up. We weren't counting on those guys. Right, it's right. It's that piece of it. But, but, if Iverson and O'Neill strike at the same time, I don't think the 11th Corps presence, what they're able to present at that time, is going to make much of a difference. Okay. That, that flank's probably going to crash, cave in. Okay. All because right. we, don't, we don't have um, uh, Baxter and um, Paul both up there at the exact same time. And, you know, they're just getting there. Yeah. That, that would be a tough argument that if you would have coordinated that properly— you, you might have got, the, you might have taken advantage of the opportunity that was presented you to you by the circumstances. So, yeah. so Rhodes, hmm, hmm. What, are you doing? Hmm. <laughs> what are you doing here? Hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and then uh, you got uh, Lee's confusion of orders from July second to July third, right? Right. Let me let, before we get into that. Here's the hmm that I have, right. and maybe you can. If you find it a hmm, too, you can go into it more. Captain Johnston's ride. Hmm. Hmm. What do you think of that? Man, the, you know, <laughs> where where do you get to? W- w- one thing that we don't argue about is is the picture of what he told. Is it looks like a horseshoe. Is that Union flank mm-hmm. on Cemetery Ridge ends before it gets down near those hills, those hills to the south? Mm-hmm. What we're conjecturing about with Johnson is how did you arrive at that conclusion? conclusion yeah. Because everything after that, well, that predicates Lee's orders for the second, right. which is okay, they got a flank in the air. I'm going to make a movement with a large body of forces, and I'm going to hit that flank in the air. Is the, the missing element to this, and when you play that out, is between, I always say, 4 a.m. was the scouting mission, 7 a.m. they returned with the info, 9 a.m. the orders were written, what is it, 11.30 to noon-ish, Longstreet gets there. Mm-hmm. How many hours are we talking about? This is a developing situation. Both armies are on the move to try and get to the point of contact at Gettysburg. Right. Yeah, they would never have seen the Fifth Corps. They, they didn't see, you know, um, parts of the Third Corps. We, that's a piece we're always, you know. Well, if you got the little round top, how could you not have seen yeah. sickles in the valley yeah. where they were, you know, encamped? Right. Uh, how'd you miss this? Or the Signal Corps. Yeah. 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 How could you have said that the hill was completely unoccupied? Maybe he got as far as Devil's Den and just looked and didn't see anybody and was like, okay. You know. Well, and he, uh, Johnson had this account that he made it to the top of this hill. Well, people look at it. Maybe it was Bushman Hill. You know, you come around yeah, to the yeah. south. You come across the Emmitsburg Road. Is it Bushman Hill that he gets to the top of instead of the big or the Little Round Top as we know it today? Because if you can put Johnson on Little Round Top, this is the... Hmm. How could hmm. you have missed the third floor? Yeah. But the the issue is it's still a developing situation. There's going to be a third core, there's going to be a fifth core. Where's the twelfth core at this point? Right. Because like then part of that is well, when when was that division of the twelfth core dismissed from the north slope of the round top to head to Culp's Hill? Well that sickles is supposed to replace that. Yeah. You know? And and so that we because we did an episode on that once with Chris Army and um I posed the question to Chris. I said, couldn't it be possible that he did get on Little Round Top in that time 
when, yeah, like yeah, that tiny I, little I, sliver of yeah. time yeah. when the 12th core was gone and the third was on its way. Yeah. Maybe. Who knows? People said about maybe the fog in the valley. Maybe. How much fog was there on the yeah. morning of the second? Does that obscure the view? Do you not hear, um, you know, the rustle, the noise of camp? Mm-hmm. You know, campfires, maybe? Do you see and smell them? The, the Smoke? Clinking and clink, yeah. clinking of cups and stuff. Yeah. And people moving around. They're just going to make no... How, you know, it, it, all the questions about... And Buford's Cavalry is out on the Emmitsburg Road, isn't it? Yeah, that's always this mysterious... <laughs> you know, they look left. They look right. It's a, the coast is clear. Go. You know, and they go across the road. <laughs> Nobody sees it. It's kind of like a Hogan's Heroes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> looking left. Looking left. Yeah, go. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. But, but they don't report that, that, hey, we had to avoid Union Cavalry. Right. right. So then it starts to be, do you mean... You got so lucky, kind of like one of those things where you just you for, you miss the stop sign and you blow across a and you miss some a truck and, that and just yeah there just happened to be no traffic or, or at yeah, that time yeah, so yeah. Not, you didn't see anything is did you just happen to cross when those pickets were had passed and they're looking that way nobody sees because right go across because it's not just Buford's men sitting on the Emmitsburg Road right. he has patrols going out on the uh, pumping station road or whatever that yeah, they, Millerstown they, Road there would be movement yeah, yeah they're, they're movement. not just sitting there no, they should be riding back and <clears throat> forth you're you know you yeah know, you're on scout you know, yeah back and forth so yeah I mean that's a lot of things that he just slipped right through through and he's on horseback right yeah and it's more than one right there's a couple it, of them. It, it's it's Johnson and two or three at least two yeah. or three more right. uh, that are together because then you, you have and the post warriors that then they're trying to talk to the other folks who were there. What do you remember? Mm-hmm. Well, how, you know, what did you see and where do you, where do you uh, say that you were? But, um, um, you, you know, to change the to, for me, when you start thinking about these hypotheticals, to change the concept of the July 2nd attack, mm-hmm. which is there's a flank in the air and we want to go move to take advantage of that. You, you would have needed to pick up on the fact that there's a lot of Union troops very near here. Right. You, you could miss the, the third, the fifths back there. You know, what are all these elements that you're not adding into the equation for Lee to take into consideration on what he wants to do on a second. Because to me, Lee is compelled at this point by the fact that he believes if I can strike the Union Army before they can get a number of their corps on the field, mm-hmm. this evens the odds for him. For sure. It, he is knowing I do not have their numbers. And, you know, in the movie, he says, you know, if we can hit them before they can come up and take out a couple of their core, we could even the odds. Right. To me, I like to, to say a compelling factor for Lee to fight them where they're at on July 2nd is that's because you're under strength. Uh, and then we can we can go into the next day. But then, then the next day, the compelling factor is we're out of options now. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have the ammo to take the risk of maneuver, to try and change the situation, get the initiative back. You run out of ammunition in the act of doing that, you, you have to call it quits anyway. Right. The compelling factor for the next day is fold up the tents and call it a quits that this didn't succeed, this campaign's over, or give it a shot. Give it a shot. D- do you have an opportunity here to achieve what it is you came here to do? Because it's, to me, one, one thing or the other. Pack it up and call it quits, or try something. Mm. So, so, but we got off the subject. No, no, no. But so, Captain Johnston's ride has always been something because yeah. I mean it basically dictates what's going to happen on July second. Yeah. yeah. But now you have on your list here Lee's confusion of orders from July second to July third. Yeah. yeah. What is that? Yeah. So, the the um, premise on the night of the second is Lee's attacks. Longstreet's uh, attack on the Union flank, um, and then Yule's attack on the the other Union flank, mm. Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, mm-hmm. is he's had troops at or near the crest. Right. He had troops hand to hand combat on top of Little Round Top. Uh, they came very near to capturing that flank. Right. Then you have troops on top of Cemetery Hill. 
and, and came very yeah. near to what what did uh, was it right say joe it, it's not the getting there it's the staying it's there. the staying there. that's right, right. And yeah it's not so hard to get in there it's the staying there right it's the staying there but but in the wake of that ladies think got to be thinking Oh, we're so close. I mean, we are so close, man. And that those two attacks were at distinctly different times. So we're talking 4 p.m., the attack on, on the Union left, which is your little round top devil's den in the wheat field. That whole thing is coming to its conclusion in that 7, 7.30 time frame. Right. When the 12th Corps is being pulled back off of Culp's Hill now, that's going to trigger Yule. Yule's attacks aren't going to get going until distinctly after, basically, everything's, everything's yeah. winding down in the other. So Lee, in retrospect, looked at him and says, says, all right, we were close. If we could hit them again, if we could reinforce these two attacks and hit them in a coordinated fashion, Meade can't move troops back and forth. You know, that interior line of that Union position, that blue fish hook. Yeah. Allows him to transfer troops yes. quickly. That's the power of that interior line. Yep. He is. If I could eliminate your ability to do that, hit you at the same time, one of them surely must be able to fall. I'm going to reinforce you. I'm going to pull troops out of town where they're seemingly <laughs> not of any right. use because <laughs> we're not being able to get any attack going, uh, you know, through the homes. And, and to yeah. be honest with you, that that kind of an encumbrance, when I look at that from a town perspective, is how are you going to form up and come through that? You're not. You're losing all kinds of cohesion. So he pulls the troops uh, out of there, swings them around, gives them to you and says, reinforce your attack on the, on the Culp cell. Pickett ought to be the reinforcement for Longstreet. Right. Okay. Now. We, a, they, as Longstreet... Ended day two. Yes. The he, reinforcement down on the south end, not the center. Right. It's right. the south end. Is right. Pickett ought to be, he, he arrived late in the day of July 2nd, checks into headquarters, in camp, rest. We mm -hmm. don't need you today. We'll need you tomorrow. Lay's thought process is Pickett should move all the way down to the end, all the way down to the, the, the Union left flank, right. reinforce Longstreet to make a renewed assault on that Union left flank on Little Round Top. At the same time, Yule's attacking Culp Hill. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you look at the difference between these commanders, Meade calls a meeting at his headquarters at midnight. He has all the corps commanders come there. Uh, 12 generals, 12 midnight, 12, 12 by 12 room, X number of cigars. You know, the second <laughs> smoke is you know, <laughs> shit. But, but he has a personal meeting. Yeah. We're all talking. He's, he's taking notes, for goodness sakes. Lee, his orders go out in written form. We, we don't have a person-to-person -person meeting where I look Longstreet in the eyes and I say, this is what we're going to do tomorrow. Right. Why, we don't have Yule and Longstreet and Lee in the same room saying, gentlemen, this is what we want to do tomorrow. This is what I'm thinking. I'm, I want to pull the reinforcement. Yule, you're going to get these brigades from, from Rhodes. Longstreet, you've got Pickett. He showed up out here. Get him moving overnight. You've got to make all these arrangements. You've got to move them mm -hmm. down there. Mm -hmm. Get ready so that at day dawn, we're all on the same page. You're both going to have renewed attack at day dawn. We don't talk about this in person. So, yeah. So, he, in other words, he's... Lee is talking to Yule separately from Longstreet, Longstreet. and Longstreet separately from Yule. No, uh, no coordination between the two with them being there, understanding what they're supposed to do and maybe yeah. co collaborating some way or another. Yeah, that it. And the confusion of orders is Longstreet will, will maintain he never got this order. So the order to to attack at day dawn and use Pickett is he has made no provisions to do this. Pickett has never been moved. He is still encamped as the sun rises on July 2nd out along the Chambersburg Pike. Yeah. He's miles from where he would need to be. Right. And Long we don't have Pickett's report, so we don't know what Pickett was told. Right. 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 Um, Longstreet will maintain this order never made it to me. Now, you can't get mixed up in the lost cause fight, you know, <laughs> no. where they vilify Longstreet. Right. Yeah, I always point out to people, we don't know that Longstreet had any disagreement about the thought processes of fighting at Gettysburg until decades after. Right. Now, that's a true leader because 
he he kept that to himself. Yeah. Okay, this walking around on the battlefield stuff in the movie saying, I've argued against it, you know, this good cop, bad cop. That's bad leadership. I don't believe long right. be able. No, I agree. I think this came out later after Lee's death when people were asking Longstreet about Gettysburg because mm-hmm. we're writing in the Century magazines and, you know, all these books. And, and he made the mistake of telling the truth. It right. was, well, if you really want to know, I thought it was a bad idea at the time. <gasps> Oh my gosh, you're questioning Lee. Right, how dare you? How dare you? And uh, his other sins of becoming a Republican and right. serving under the Grant administration, that none of this helps his cause. So then they vilify him, and then they look for all of the points to prove you purposefully failed at Gettysburg. It's crazy. It is crazy. It's crazy. It is but crazy. anyway, but Longstreet will maintain he didn't get the order. <laughs> What makes me go, hmm, 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 hmm. <laughs> this is pretty important. Ride down there and find him. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is some of the scholarship I've looked at and I've read is we believe the order was brought to Longstreet's headquarters. And we should blame staff work on this. Okay. Is here's, a, here's an order from the general. The staff of Longstreet takes it. Okay. I'll put it right here. He should be back shortly. Uh huh. He sleeps in the field that night. He doesn't return to headquarters. Uh huh. Staff should have went and found, found him, him. Yeah. and said, "You have a communication from the general. You probably should read this." Yeah. All right. Is there's a breakdown in staff work here? Is one of the one of the beliefs uh-huh. is how did this not make it to him? Okay. By the time there's no shooting at dawn on July third, it's too late. The original plan of attacking the Union Army, the coordination is lost. Yule's underway. And Yule gets attacked first. And, and the Union Army preempts that. Yeah. Because after Meade's meeting, they realize, probably before the Confederates surely did, there was nobody between them and the Baltimore Pike. Right. Because they had taken Lower Culp's Hill or um, Spangler, Spangler. Spangler Hill. Yeah. Is... There's no real force between you and the one of the the, the supply road. Mm-hmm. Meade rectifies that by boxing that in with six core mm-hmm. and the returning twelfth core. So if you look at it on the map, he boxes that incursion into his line almost completely. You know, from the south and the west, yeah. with orders to drive them out in the morning. The Union Army preempts the attack on the lower portion of the hill, and you know you get total agreement. We'll attack, so will you. You know, kind of a thing. Right. And um, and so you've got that fighting all underway. No coordination on the Union left. Longstreet's completely absent of this whole equation. It's because this confusion of orders. And I think that's all the attention it gets in the Visitor Center film. Is there's one line in that film. And it says overnight Lee makes plans. You know, they do make the point that the eventual... Assault on the Union Center isn't the original not, but, thought. Right, right. They do make that point on on the on the film, um, but there's been a confusion of orders. That's that's it. That's all they say, and and that's this breakdown in the communications that Longstreet never got the order. But what makes me go, hmm, is hmm. Hmm. this is so critical to the outcome of a battle? Yeah, that you're leaving it to a letter. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, you could have a meeting with Longstreet. So you could have a meeting with Yule. You could call them to the office, whatever call, you yeah. want to do. It, wouldn't you think that it would demand a first hand? Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, make Tickets sure you understand. You're going to get him moved, right? Because doesn't he do that on July 2nd? He, he meets with Longstreet and tells, and, and McClaws is there, right? And then he. He lets them know what he wants done. You're going to move on the Union? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to move, march down there on the Union left. This is going to be the attack. Yeah, there's people present, and we're all talking about it. This doesn't happen yeah. for this coordinated piece that Longstreet's to renew. Because of that, then, we've got to come up with a new plan, which, you know, becomes your... Well, maybe that's why Lee was saying it was all my fault. Because he's like, you know, I should have really taken the reins a little better. tighter in the beginning. Now, let me ask you this. In your opinion, 
Lee's, um, to me, it's like, you know, you could blame all, you could blame Stewart, you could blame Longstreet, you could blame Yule, you could blame all these people. But at the end of the day, the buck stops with Lee. Lee, Lee could have, like you said, called them all to headquarters and had a come to Jesus moment with him. He could have, and which I think he did, he did go to them, like he went out to Yule's headquarters, didn't he? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, you know, he could have he taken the bull by the horns a little better. Do you think he doesn't do that because, well, that's never been his style before. He always had trusted subordinates, didn't need to. Um, or do you think it's because he had diarrhea? Because, I mean, you know, when your I stomach's hurting. Yeah. Eh. I, um, th- this, come up, we, th- this comes up with some frequency. The diarrhea comes the, up the, a lot. The question yeah. of Lee's health. Yeah. And it started by the, uh, yeah. The angina. That's, that's not a, hmm. That's yeah. a, hmm. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a, oh. yeah. um, the heart issue. Yes. He, he, he's had a heart attack. Yeah. Previously. He's dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and the, the, the symptoms of that. The reason why that ends up coming up is I think people are looking for an excuse for this marble man. I agree. Is, Oh, you, you lost the Gettysburg. There has to be some right. reason, right? Diarrhea. I mean, you're you're awesome. You're undefeated. You, you would never have lost, if unless there's some other compelling reason. We're looking for an excuse, right? Sure. Is I I don't buy it. I, I don't think it. I don't think it enters into his decision making. Some people have taken it so far as to think that he's so weary and so fatigued that he's grasping at straws. You know, yeah, kind of a thing. I, I don't think it would be. I, I don't like to input it as as to you know a compelling reason for the outcome of what it was. Do you, do you think it, he might have bit off more than he could chew by invading? Like that he was a better defensive general. I think. I think so much of the way it plays out goes back to that the Jeb. To the what? To Jeb Stewart. Oh, the, to Jeb Stewart. The first hum, you know, hum, <laughs> yeah. is. You know, when that initiative flipped, yeah. It, now you're not dealing the cards. He's They're reacting. Dealing, you're reacting yeah. to it. The, you know, the day one plays out as it plays out, and, they, and the Confederates win. Yes. They, they bring it to bear. They, they, they land on the flank, and they win that fight. Right. And you've driven them from the field. You, you, uh, 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 you, you inflict more casualties on them than they on you. And that's pretty. That's pretty compelling when you're the attacker, and right. you know the three thousand you capture in the town swings the the tail there. Nine thousand Union casualties to seven thousand Confederates on on day one. So you win by both main measures. Who controls the field and who uh, inflicts. In, inflicts more casualties? But both to Lee's army. He's won day one. Right. Then you, you get into you know the hill wasn't taken. What I like to point out as, as what I believe the main compelling factor to stay and fight on day two is that whole numerical thought process, which is scout them. They don't have seven core up here. I, I'm probably closer to my full strength than they are to their full strength, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. Uh, of what you're really going to put in the field at this point. You're talking infantrymen. Especially those two core that are left over from July 1st. They're like basically nothing. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. hammered, right? Yeah. Um, is I still have got a 1v1, a one-on-one type scenario here I could play. I To me, Lee's got to be willing to take that. Right. I, I'll take a one-on-one, us against you, in any of these scenarios, if I can get it. And I think that's his compelling thing for staying and fighting on July 2nd is neither of us knew we were going to land here. Okay, we ran into each other. Now as it's playing out, I still think I have an opportunity to get at you when it's closest, still close to one on one. Once that doesn't work out on July second, as I said, then the next compelling factor is: what are my options? I think it, if you look at all the different things, you know, and Longstreet would argue about maneuver. Mm-hmm. Longstreet's argument to maneuver is to try and get the initiative back. Right. You get into a fixed position, make them attack you. 
Lee's worry about that is, A, disconnecting from his lifeline back toward the valley is he can't let the Union Army get between him and it. Mm -hmm. Because his avenue is not toward D.C. to go back home. Right, right. To go back home, you're going to go back to the west and down the valley. Yeah, he needs to keep that open. I need to keep that open. And the other thing is, um, in the act of maneuver, how much ammo do I expend to the point where I don't have much left to even fight you? Yeah. So it's over anyway. So if I'm going to do something, I have to stay and get it done today. The enemy is there. I will then, attack him. And I will attack yeah. him there. Is is we're just about out of ammo, you know. But what always boggled my mind, though, was that, you know, Lee spent, uh, you know, a good portion of his career prior to Gettysburg on the defensive, uh, uh, occupying good positions like i'm thinking of fredericksburg in, in 1k i mean that's yeah. a great position and now how is he not seeing that the union army on the second day is now in the good position and and yeah okay you did well on the first you think you might still be closer to your full strength than he is to his but he has way better ground than you you're gonna have to attack uh, and they're on hills they're on ridges that are better than the ridges on july 1st so how, like Lee, it, 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 what's so weird to me is that it seems like it's his first day on the job, this battle. Well, the, the scouting, though, Johnson told him that's not the case. That Union flank sitting on a, a okay. pretty flat spot. The left, but we, we still. We can get at that left. You have Cemetery Hill, though. You know, and but, I know he's he trying will, to take it up the, the flank. He, he's going to take it up the flank and... and I always call that the hammer into an anvil. Yep. Is he's not trying to drive them away from Gettysburg. He's trying to destroy, destroy them, them at Gettysburg. Is I'm going to hit you on the backside of Cemetery Hill. Uh -huh. and it doesn't matter how strong that is on the other side. I don't care. Yule's got you held in place there. Longstreet's going to crumple you up. Hold him by the nose. Destroy kick him in the, the pants. Army of the Potomac here, yeah. which is what we came here to do. A, a win so decisive that it might bring about a negotiation of peace is... The scouting dictates that they're not in uh, uh, such a strong position. He's seeing a vulnerability there, like a Chancellorsville. Sure. You know, there are flanks in the air over on the end. And if we would march around there, yeah, we're going to catch them by surprise. But hold on, because Lee at this point is like someone who's only seen the movie Gettysburg. You know how the person who's only seen the movie Gettysburg goes, oh, if only Longstreet would let Hood go around to the right, yeah. this thing would have been different. Yeah. And then someone who's done more research than watched the movie goes, well, that's not taking into account what's behind the round tops right. and what's coming up from Maryland in that direction right. and what Hill would have had to deal with uh, if he had done that. Or, right. I'm sorry, Hood would have had to deal with if, if he had done that. Right. And so... Lee is kind of the same way, though, because uh, he's he's only reacting to what he can see, right. but he doesn't know what's coming up behind him. No. So he's to attack that flank in my mind. And maybe this is because I know what is coming. But that is uh, putting Longstreet's Corps in uh, pretty unnecessary danger. But then again, he can't attack Cemetery Hill head on. No, uh, he can't attack. Culp's Hill head on. No, nope. shouldn't at least. Nope. Um, uh, he could attack Cemetery Ridge, but as we'll see on the third, that doesn't really work out. But but again, there's not that many troops there at that point, so right. maybe that could have helped. Uh, instead, he decides to roll up the flank, but he then exposes or potentially exposes the flank of Longstreet's Corps to attack from arriving reinforcements on the Union side. Right. So I mean, it's 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 really hard to second guess the guy because yeah. you know he had a lot to consider. I just, I just, I just find it odd. I just, I, I, the more I learn about it, the more I'm like, why did he even choose to fight here? Is like he should have disengaged. To, to me, yeah. <sighs> Not that I wanted him to win the war, right? But you know, but yeah, and that's completely Monday morning quarterbacking is. Of course, when, when July first disengage, we're going to fight the Battle of Emmitsburg. You know, right? That's where the <laughs> that's yeah. where the decisive battle was. But, right. He, he's got to fight here, though. I, mean, I know, no, I, he I know. Has to. I mean, he's got yeah. Grant Scott Pemberton bottled up in Vicksburg, and that's the whole reason that Lee came north, right? Got to win Lee, a decisive. Yeah. Great point. Yeah, Lee had that meeting with uh, Jefferson. Or, yeah, with Davis Jefferson before Davis, he yeah. before he began this campaign, yeah, and was yeah. given that choice: go relieve Pemberton or go do your thing. 
you know, once Lee gets up here, his clock starts ticking. Everything becomes finite for him. His men, his food, his ammunition, just like he, you said. And here he is. This is it. I, you know, you're right. Like, he has to have that decisive battle. Victory. I just think he should have tried to find a different piece of ground. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, for me, July 2nd is urgency. He sends those scouts out mm. at 4 a.m. There's an urgency. Is yeah. is he knows the clock's ticking, and as the hours go by, he's he knows he's got to believe elements of the Army of the Potomac are headed this way right. as quick as possible. Why doesn't he know exactly where the elements of the Army of the Potomac are? Stewart Jeb, mm, right? Mm. Yeah. Then we get orders. Longstreet's not all up. He's actually got to wait on the on the, the elements of his, his divisions to show up. Pickett's over the mountain, so he's not going to have Pickett. So he's got right. two of his divisions. Now we're going to march down to the south to get into a position to strike the, strike the Union flank. And we don't know what roads we're supposed to take. Mm. So you got the whole reverse march? Yeah. Well, yeah. Why do we not know exactly the route to take that's the most efficient and out of view of the Union Army. Yeah, another lack great of question. cavalry. Yeah, to me. Now, wouldn't this? Is it, have but been is it taken, a lack of cavalry though, or, or could uh, could staff officers have done that job? Staff officers could have done yeah. this job as well, because you always can make that argument too. E. e. Porter Alexander got down there exactly, and, and <laughs> James uh, Jim Hessler does a great job on that reverse <laughs> march. He says, you know, he added up all the horses and, and and the wheels, yeah, that went through the field over there on, on the ridge, right, where he cut around. They should have made so, a mark. Okay, you you don't have to be a, a, an expert Indian scout to see where, <laughs> you know, several thousand horses cut through a couple fields, right? Look, doesn't that make you wonder who went that way? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do we really have to turn around everybody and go back the other right. way? Can we just go to that? But urgency, 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 because the clock is ticking. I've got a scenario here where it might have a 1v1. Mm -hmm. But as the hours go by, the, the risk here is those odds can change. The faster we can get at them and take advantage of the 1v1 situation, we've got to do it. Mm. And I think as, in retrospect... As you look at that, and so much attention is put on the Longstreet reverse march, I think um, uh, Jim Hessler, they did calculation, and he was you know, looking at the, the pace of march. I think, if I remember right, Jim can correct me, 45 minutes to an hour right, yeah, is so the total maybe difference that this made. Okay, but an hour, and now you've got this completely changed scenario. Mm -hmm. Sickles has done what he's done. Even if Sickles completely complies with the thought process and he connects the second chord to the little round top long streets attack cannot go off the way it was originally planned right because a lot of people they'll ask me well you know should sickles have done this and, and would long streets of attack have succeeded I, said, well, I don't know that because you know long streets attack can't go off the way it should if Sickles has a continuous cemetery ridge line right. and little round top, mm -hmm. Longstreet still has to punt and say, wait a minute, we're going to have to move south yeah. if we're going to do this. There's a different flank now. Right, because if he goes with the, the original down plan, here. Sickles is on his flank now. If he goes with the original plan. Yeah, if right. he would actually have gone over that ridge, the Peach Orchard Ridge, yeah. past the Sherfy House, what he would have found out <laughs> is he had a bunch of Union troops on his flank. Yes. Is it would have gone bad, yeah. maybe even worse. And then to attack that position head on probably wouldn't have ended well either because there's a lot of open ground. The artillery yeah. could have basically right. done Pickett's Charge the day before Pickett's right. Charge. So a little, less, little less distance, to, you know, that killing ground's a little sure. closer. But it's than, also marshier. It, there's a lot more obstacles yeah. to, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So yeah, right. So Longstreet. Yeah. It's it's a it's a tough thing. And of course, we are Monday morning quarterbacking here. Right. But um, but that's what's the fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> that's why it's fun. All right. So why don't we do this here? Uh, unless you have another thought to add to that, close it off. No, no. Okay. So we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll take uh, just a couple of minutes here to uh, hear from our wonderful sponsors, and then we'll come back. And we don't really have questions. Well, people did submit things, but they're not really questions. They're more thoughts and uh, you know topics of discussion. So that's what. We'll do. We'll uh, open it up uh, to uh, Jason, Joseph, and myself, and we'll discuss these things that the uh, listeners have sent in. Take a break. We'll be right 
back. Hmm. 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 <laughs> For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our subtlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. Ever wanted to be a part of a movie production? Well, now is your chance. Hope Kelly is still struggling with heartache several years after her abrupt life-changing decision to buy an apple farm outside the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. But the loneliness of isolation gradually replaced the peace she initially found on the farm. Sent reeling when her fiancé left her for another woman before a previous Christmas, Hope has sworn off Christmas and relationships. But when her brother Ryan's old army buddy Nick shows up to the farm and is immediately taken with Hope, the temperature starts to rise. Still, it will take a Christmas miracle in the form of Charlie to help mend Hope's heart and allow her to trust again and find love. Join writer, producer, and director Bo Brinkman in the production of A Gettysburg Christmas with named talents like Jake Busey and Lee Majors. The script has tailored scenes to shoot at specific locations to highlight the beauty, history, and capture the Christmas spirit of Gettysburg with the goal of inspiring viewers to visit in droves. Those of you who have been wanting another movie to revitalize interest in visiting our awesome town have finally gotten your wish. And now you can be a part of getting this project off the ground. Bo and company are turning to you, the citizens of Gettysburg and the lovers of Gettysburg, to make this grassroots effort work. No Hollywood BS, just pure Christmas joy and romance. Just click the link in the show notes to get started or go to GoFundMe.com and search for A Gettysburg Christmas. Hey, Gettysburg business owners. Winter is just around the bend, and you know what that means. No tourists. But just because people aren't coming to you doesn't mean you can't bring your business to them. If you ship, you're still in the game. And if you're a seasonal business, the time to advertise for your next season is in the off-season when people are making their plans. So what's an affordable yet highly effective way of reaching those people? Well, it's not radio. 
It's not TV, and it's certainly not print. Step out of the Jurassic era of advertising and run an ad on Addressing Gettysburg. We just reached one million downloads, and we're growing by the tens of thousands every month. Beyond that, our audience is happy to support those who support their favorite podcast. So email sales at Addressing Gettysburg for more information about advertising on our show. We look forward to helping your business grow. That's sales at AddressingGettysburg.com. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. Okay, and we are back with our guest, Jason Heilman, and uh, we've got some, uh, like I said, some topics of discussion, not really questions this time, from uh, some of our patrons. If you would like to submit questions, or in this case, topics of discussion, uh, you need to be a patron at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Uh, not only do you get to ask questions, but there's plenty of other perks, like, for example, when we hold uh, live events, whether they be shows or Christmas parties or whatever it may be, you get get uh, notified of it ahead of time, number one. Uh, you get uh, to buy or sign up for tickets um, before the general public also. And when it is a pay event, uh, your tickets as a patron are cheaper. You get a discount um, for being a patron because, uh, well, you keep us going. So we want to uh, pay you back somehow. And that's one of the ways we do it. Starting off, though, here we have Robert McGee. He says, my biggest hmm is that Gettysburg has to be the most studied battlefield event in American history. And yet the more I read, talk to others and even walk the battlefield, the more I realize the incredible amount of things that we simply do not know. And maybe worse, that so many of the things we thought we knew might well not be so. Makes you wonder how much we really don't know about the other moments in military history that are not as intensely studied. Um, I was just talking about this the other day with someone, and I think Robert has a good point here. Is um, I kind of I'm start the more I study this stuff, the more I look at it as the like kind of like the Bible. Like it's got it's good stories, but do we know it's actually true? Can we prove that this happened or that happened? Uh, in some cases, of course, we can. You know, there's there's a lot of but. It's the smaller stories that, and of course, I don't have one on the top of my head right now to to give you as an example. But it's those smaller stories that that a lot of people um, speculate or conjecture on or whatever that um, I think kind of fit into that. It's like we we really don't know. And if you think about it, a lot of the guys that we're getting these stories from wrote them down decades after it happened. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And and not only that, let's say the ones who wrote it down a day after it happened, their view of what was going on was very limited. That's right. Yeah. So it, to to re- and, and and if you if you think about life today, um, whether it be a, a major national event like like nine eleven, for example, or just just something that happens in your life, which you know history doesn't record, but you do. Um, it's confusing. You get six people that experience the same event that you're talking about in one room. And you talk about it and there's no, 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 that's not how it happened. You know, he walked over here and said this or did that or whatever. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. So um, to me, it's like it's enough to like read the stories and go, well, in essence, this is true. Yeah. Is this a hard, absolute fact? No, maybe. I don't know. Could be. But at least the essence of the story is true, and it's right. a good story, and it's inspiring for, yeah. for many people. What do you think? Well, when you first read the comment, the one thing that came to my mind is, and many people say this, is certainly not my quote, is you read one book and you're an expert. You read two, you're confused. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's the fact of this, yeah. is you read all these different accounts. And you know one of the things that caught me up early on is uh, – You know, you read a narrative by an author Mm -hmm. on the subject. You think, wow, okay, I'm getting, starting to understand it. Oh, look, here's a firsthand account. This should be even better because this is a firsthand account. And then you read it and you think, it's nothing. Really? Yeah. I'm going to throw the challenge flag on that. I I like that. (laughs) I'm going to challenge it. Yeah. Did you really say that? Is then the realization I got to is, you got to look at who wrote it. And the fact of the matter is everybody has an agenda. Yes. Whether it's a purposeful agenda 
or, or just they're bent on mm-hmm. something, you know, you get into that whole lost cause thing. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that stuff you have to take with a very big grain of salt. But yeah. how? But then you have to be able to recognize its lost cause. Right. Right. It, so you like, got an agenda here. It, you, you will get more out of those things once you understand who that author is, uh-huh. what part they played in this, and where are they at in their life that, that they want to make sure this is remembered or remembered a certain way right? Um, kind of a thing. And so the, the other thing that came to mind there, Matt, is – and you see this on a two-hour tour. There, there's only a certain level of detail you can get into in a two-hour tour, right, right? Right, right? And so you keep it up here. Those people go away, and they're going to fill in the gaps. N- not, uh, uh, you know, they don't mean to be inaccurate about it, but in their mind, as they're painting the picture of mm. the story you're telling, is that they they're filling their their own gaps. I see what you're saying. And yeah. we all do that, yep. even when we get to a little bit lower level. I would make some assumptions that you wouldn't make. You read the exact same thing, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. but we, I'm picturing it in my mind as I'm reading it. You're picturing it in your mind as you're reading it. Yeah. And, and then we come away with some different ideas and some different thoughts as we're close. We're, we're filling in the details ourselves. And we're all, yeah, exactly. And we all think differently and, and weigh different things more than others. And so like, let's say for example, the 20th main, and we're reading about that, and you know, my mind might be going to, uh, yeah, I don't know, like just like ammunition or whatever, right? Yeah. And yours might be going to something completely different, like you know, uh, tactics or, or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. And and so then we we fi- we figure, well, maybe they did this because, in my case, they're low on ammunition. Or you're like, well, maybe they did this because tactically this is sound because of yada yada yada. Yeah. And yeah, and so everybody comes away with a different thing. And then it just, as I said, the twentieth man, it just made me think. Like, then you got pop culture, movies, yeah. art, pa- paintings. You know, before movies were a thing, you had paintings of of these events, and that mm-hmm. puts a picture in people's minds. Yeah. And it reminds me of uh, an interview in the '90s. I think I saw with uh, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. And uh, it was a time when they had that big album with those Alicia Silverstone videos and everything. Yeah, you know? yeah. and, uh, and But Steven Tyler in the interview was saying, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the thing that makes you go, hmm. Uh, Steven Tyler said, he goes, you know, I never liked videos because it puts a picture in the listener's mind and forever associates that song with that image and that may not be what the song is about no. but that's what the director and the producer and the record company wanted the video to be right and uh, so the same thing with you know the movie Gettysburg when you talk to people about the 20th Main and you really get into the details of everything and you talk about well the Confederates were kind of ready to retreat Call anyway course, and, yeah. and you know it just it was like a lot of really coincidental things that happened but yeah. Chamberlain was a really bright guy right. and he had a bully pulpit and he wrote well mm-hmm. and he kind of shaped it to make it look like oh yeah yeah I meant to do that yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> and maybe he did yeah but you know, there's some guys who are like, I don't really remember it happening that way. Right. It just kind of happened. Yeah. You know, I forget his lieutenant's name. Uh, it was a Melcher? Runner. Spears? Spe- well, maybe. Uh, yeah. Because they had a rift, right? Afterwards. Yeah, afterwards. Him, yeah. him and Spears. Yeah. yeah. So there wasn't this, you know, bayonet no. you know, moment no. that everybody could hear. No, but and everybody's a, fixing bayonets. But it's a great scene it's, in the movie. Yeah. And the other thought that came to mind was, let's not let a good story get in the way of, of truth. You yes. Know, right? And, yes. um, and so it's better that way, you know, that we, you know, that he hollers out the band yeah. as, as opposed to, you know, we wouldn't have ever heard that anyway. This is how it, you know, came about. But I always go, gravitate back. To, but what do we know? Right. Does it change in any way the facts of what we do know is the outcome of this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That, that hasn't changed. No. The, the outcome the of this still was, won. you know, yeah. they, they still won. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, next one here is Joe Jacobs. He says, The night fighting on July 2nd at Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. I could never figure out how one side was able to coordinate an attack over rough terrain and the other defend against it <clears throat> without tripping and falling over uh, over one another. They had to have tripped and fell over one another. First of all, it's dark, right? And muzzle flashes are bright. And so that's got to blind you. 
So whatever available light there is, I mean, you know, a, a couple of uh, volleys from muskets and a few cannon go off, and you're walking into that. Like, I'm sorry, what are you going to be able to see? Shoot in that direction, you know. Yeah. Yes, you know, both sides. Once it became dark, you know, that Confederate alignment and getting that started to get across Rock Creek yeah. and get started on that attack up the slopes. Um, you got some daylight there. Mm-hmm. It's not dark, dark at Gettysburg in 1863 till 830, yeah. you know, because you got to lose that daylight savings time. Right, right. I always relate to people at, at your ball game, like if they're in this part of the country, at your ball game, what time do the kids need to be in? Like, you're not going to be able to see the ball anymore. Well, by 930, mm-hmm. it's dark, dark, early yeah. July is, okay, that's 830. We're going to get this started. In that 730, there's enough light for, for the Confederates to get across, get alignment. And then once we're underway, then it's on. Mm-hmm. It's shoot where you see the muzzle flashes. Um, and likewise, the Union line, they're shooting where they see muzzle flashes. Right. We're just shooting in that direction as opposed to aiming at a visible person, yeah. a visible yeah. object. Yeah. And I often tell folks. The Union defenders would not actually know the degree of carnage that they uh, inflicted there until the sun would come up. Yeah, makes sense. They, they they could hear the moaning and groaning of wounded, but to what degree, how many did we hold off? I, I don't think they had a true appreciation for that when it was happening. Mm. They're just loading and firing and survival at, at this point. Um, I don't. They, they did not have a feel for. For, for the odds there. Do we know what the moon was? You know, uh, it had to be near full. Yeah. Because Meade, uh, Meade's account of the night of July 1 is he could see the field when he got here. Okay. Midnight is when he did a reconnaissance of the field looking at the terrain is there was enough moonlight he could see it. So okay. it was like a clear sky, pretty full moon. So we're not far off of that. Um, was it a clear sky on July 2nd? D- don't know that. Yeah. And don't forget, that, you know, that you've got the high canopy of trees over there. So it's darker on the hill than out in the open field. So those, you're talking about the trees um, at the foot of the hill? Uh, uh, of Culp's Hill. So oh, Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill. Okay, Hill. I'm sorry. thinking, uh, you know, <clears throat> yeah. down that uh, uh, George Sears Green line down to the, the little swale there is that's all high canopy of trees at the time of the battle. So it's darker in the wood, quicker sure. than out in the open fields. Right. So you're going to lose the light there quicker. And then once those uh, black powder muskets are going off, you've got smoke. Yeah. So that's going to obscure more light. So it's darker for them, quicker than if you know somebody was out in an open field where you would be able to discern silhouettes a lot better than you would in a canopy of trees like that. Yeah. But the Union Army's static for the most part. Right. Confederates are the ones needing to move. Right. And so the the commentary was, how, how did they not stumble into each other? Well, f- the vast majority of the fighting front, Union static behind the breastworks, Confederates moving, and, you know, they're just shooting at muzzle flashes at that point, and they are tripping and falling. Yeah. They, they, they can't see their foot. Yeah, they can't see their footing. I'm sure Dude, they're, you know. All I go the, walking through the woods on Culp's Hill in the daylight, and I trip and fall. Trip and fall. <laughs> You know, yeah. you got a bunch of leaves piled up and there's a root underneath you didn't see and you trip over it. But Union reinforcements have to go down to the swale where Ireland, you know, is yeah. refusing his flank. Right. You know, where the where the new flank of the Union Army is there. So there's reinforcements that move in there. And uh, who is it? The seventy second Pennsylvania comes across yeah, to I reinforce. So. And they're the ones that turn around and go let's back. Go back and, and one yeah, shot and they're like, right. let's not do this. No, I can't yeah. really see. Let's just, let's go back. <laughs> it's <is> dangerous. <laughs> I have hay so, fever. I don't think that the hard attack I had was gluten free. And and then they do stumble into each other when the twelfth corps comes back. Yeah. So after their little foray down the Baltimore Pike <laughs> and we decide to come back, then you know, you have the incidents where they they yeah. walk into Confederate lines right, in the right. dark. Uh, some prisoners. Three cheers back. for Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, that's right. Bang. And then <laughs> and so it's funny because when so he mentions Culps and Cemetery Hill. For some reason, um when we started talking about this, I, I was picturing Cemetery, Cemetery Hill. I wasn't even thinking of Culp's Hill. And then you're talking about the canopy of trees. And that's when I realized, oh, you're talking about Culp's Hill. So we're talking about two different hills. You're thinking about yeah. Cemetery Hill. But it, and that's why I was asking what the moon was, because if it's Cemetery Hill. You could see. You could see. see. Yeah. 
Yeah. Theoretically. I mean, yeah. there was, unless there was cloud cover. I don't know. I'd have to check uh, Professor Jacobs' notes. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but people wrote detailed accounts on the Battle of Cemetery Hill, that hand to hand fighting up at the, yeah. the artillery. Yeah, so yeah. Across from the something, house. right? Yeah. They know who they're slugging when they're swinging <laughs> their, their ramrods and their rifles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So there's like, there are clear pictures that people wrote about Cemetery Hill. It, yeah. It, it, including, you know, when the um, 11th Corps line. Reinforcements come across. What is it? They they fire three organized volleys from the other side of the Baltimore Pike mm -hmm. on Hayes, Louisianians, mm -hmm. and he's ordering don't return fire. Though he's thinking he that's think it's Rhodes, Rhodes guys that's right. who were supposed to come yes. up over there, and there's a confusion in the darkness. They shouldn't be firing on us. Don't fire back. Right till about the third round, and then it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's them. who cares? <laughs> yeah, you've got to defend yourself, man. Shoot we're not going to stand here and take this. You know, so there is some confusion in the dark, but uh, they could see the people. You know, once you get out in the open, I, I would imagine you can see somebody is there. Yeah, yeah. You just can't make out who. There's no. Yeah, you're not you're not able to see uh, a football field away, but you can see who's in front of yeah, you. And yeah, and you would be able to discern there's a line of men over there. And of course, when the volley rips off, you know, you see the the fire and the smoke. That night fighting had to be the worst, though. I mean, it had to be terrifying. And then not only that, but like I'm saying, with the muzzle flashes and stuff, like that'll temporarily blind you. So you can't even see what the hell is coming. Uh, that's got to be the worst. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, let's see here. Aaron Smith, every time he calls in on our uh, AG Today show, the live show on Fridays, um, the um, talk to text screener thinks his name is Aaron uh, but I and I always go, Aaron, you're on the air, and he goes, it's Aaron. <laughs> and I'm like, Oops. <laughs> anyway, Aaron says, I think a huge hmm moment would be hmm, hmm. just how close Yule came to capturing Harrisburg. It was a huge industrial city, the PA state capital, and vital stop in several rail networks. Makes me go hmm hmm. hmm. Thinking about what reaction would have been, uh, what the reaction would have been if the South took Harrisburg. What do you think the reaction would have been if the South took Harrisburg? If if all things were the same, but Yule was a little earlier, and he took uh, Harrisburg. That might have. What would that? What do you think that would have done for Lee? Like Lee, oh wow, we have Harrisburg. Forget about everybody coming here to Cashtown and Gettysburg. Let's go up there. What What do you think that would have done? Well, <clears throat> as I look at it, the the Lee's intended outcome of capturing Harrisburg was newsworthy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what he's trying to do, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. you're sending a message. So when they disperse, when Lee disperses his army in Pennsylvania, two main reasons. Supply, opportunity, the, the greater the area that you cover, the great oppor greater opportunity for cattle, horses, hogs, chickens, grains, tons of fodder for the horses. Right. And the second reason is you're sending a message. To capture that capital uh, of one of the largest union states— sends a message to the people of the North. Hmm. The war is not going well, and in fact, it's getting worse. Right. We have made it all the way to and occupy one of your capitals. Yeah. Is I think less about the logistical aspects that, that uh, Aaron right uh -huh. mentioned. Aaron, yep. Is mm, maybe you tear up some railroad. Maybe you do a little bit of damage like that. Maybe you get uh, some significant supply f from that. That's all temporary. You're not going to occupy that town for very long. Um, and you know what? They'll have that railroad rebuilt in two or three days. Mm -hmm. You know, and things will be back back in production. It's just uh, to scare everyone, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's, I hate to use the word because it carries connotations today, but terror. Yeah. It is you're spreading terror. It's the message yes. that he's sending by doing that. That was uh, that's how I always relate the intent of that lead thrust to Harrisburg is newsworthy. Right. Make the papers. And it makes we sense. We made it all the way to Harrisburg and took it. And that is more terrifying than Gettysburg being occupied because nobody's ever heard of Gettysburg. No. But Harrisburg, whether you've heard it, whether you know the capital of Pennsylvania, if you read an article that says State capital of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg. Harrisburg, the state capital of Pennsylvania, was sacked yesterday. Um, that's scary, right? Because it's like, well, Jesus, if they can get that, yeah, they can go there. Th what, what can't they do? Philadelphia next. Phil the New York, yeah. Trenton. That's everybody only, in New Jersey is like, go ahead, have it. Philadelphia is always brought up because if he had been completely unfettered, Union Army moved very, very slowly. Hmm. 
What psychological message, what impact for a Confederate army in Philly? Yeah. The, 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 the place of the Constitution, yeah. the Liberty Bell, the founding, the of, the founding of the country, yeah. does that carry more weight than a D.C.? Uh, yeah, uh, I would think so yeah. at that time. Yeah, no. yeah. And, and the now whole, it wouldn't. The, the whole philosophy here is, is there enough anti-war sentiment building right. that these messages, these outcomes of t- taking such a predominant place, impacting it, it's not going to be an occupying force. I mean— he he would never have allowed himself to become under a siege situation right. in a capital. Um, it's just newsworthy. Is what it is. There's there's no tactical advantage no, to it though. No. What he I mean, what he's going to do is he's going to cut himself off to his his limited supply line, and then his escape back to Virginia just in case. I mean, if he puts himself in Harrisburg, I mean, there's there's a little bit of strategic advantage there, but from a tactical standpoint, I think it puts him in danger. It, to, yeah. it, it does, and, and you think about it. Where's the body of his army when he sends the inv- the, the uh, invading force to Harrisburg? It's clear down here at the Pennsylvania the, the, border. The, yeah, it doesn't go any further than Chambersburg. No. Why? Because he's just a few short miles from the border. He, the body of his force is not going to overextend itself right. all the way up there for a Union army to cut him off from the south so that and if, be in his way. If Ewell had taken it, if Ewell had taken Harrisburg, Lee's not going to take the other two-thirds of the army go up there because now they're really stretched. That's correct. I would not see anything yeah. playing out like that. Right. There's no way he was going to send Hill and Longstreet up to Harrisburg. No, because, he's right, waiting to develop yeah, this situation. Right. Okay, all right, good. Uh, Brian Jackson, my hmm moment involves the first day's battle. Reported, you, reportedly, Ewell informed Lee that he could attack Cemetery Hill if he had support from the right. If uh, uh, Lee held back Anderson's division from... Uh, there's no if there, I'm sorry, I just threw that in for some reason. Lee held back Anderson's division from Hill's Corps, stating that he was the Army's only reserve. However, Johnson's division from Ewell's Corps was on the way, as well as Longstreet's Corps. If Anderson's division attacked the western slopes of Cemetery Hill, along with Ewell's Corps, present from the north, there may not have been a second day of battle uh, at Gettysburg. So uh, let me just make sure. So in other words, he's saying Anderson is fresh, right? Anderson's troops have not been engaged so far on July 1st. They're right. fresh. They're up there. Lee's, Lee's argument is, well, they're my reserve. So if I use them up trying to take that hill uh, and the, the Union maybe counterattacks or something, I can't. I have nothing. Right. 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 So I've got to hold my reserve until more fresh troops come up. Right. Is essentially what. Lee's thinking is, right? right? right. Okay. So, now let's see. Brian's saying, so Lee held back Anderson's division, right? Okay. However, Johnson's division, okay, well, so Johnson's division is is delayed. Why? Uh, Because of the road. Because of the road. Traffic jam. There's a traffic jam. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Johnson's not readily available at at this point, maybe, where he's talking about? Johnson, I did a, and this was on a request. Uh, a gentleman a few years ago said, I'd like you to give me, that was two or three hours. Might have been two, and I turned it into three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know we any t- guy who takes a two-hour to- tour and leaves it at two hours. T- <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 and you don't get paid I'll, for that third, no, do you? No, no you throw no, that in. Yeah, no, yeah, you get this for free. <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> is um, Tell me why you didn't take that hill. And so I... And, and I always like to approach everything with um, uh, the man in the arena mm-hmm. uh, viewpoint. Is, yeah. uh, I'm not here to criticize. Uh, I, if I don't understand something and it, it just makes me go, hmm, you know, <laughs> look deeper. <laughs> These are intelligent people. Right. They're, they're all here with the same agenda. Yeah. No, nobody came here and said, yeah, I'm going to dismantle this. I'm right. Right. Thwart all your plans. Right. Yeah. There's no. There's no Benedict Arnold. Right. There. We're, gonna fought, tr- we're trying to. I've do fought this. for this cause for X amount of months or years so far. And now, because we're invading, which could be a big thing for us, I'm going to screw I'll it up screw for it up. everybody. Yeah, no, yeah, this. nobody's doing nobody's that. Nobody's doing no. that. Is you, you'll try. And so I dug and I'm like, okay, you, you got to look at, look deeper. What are all the reasons? And Johnson, um, isn't pulling in the the accounts there is 
he's marching into Chambersburg Pike. They divert onto the railroad cut mm-hmm. right out where the traffic light is today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he's the traffic light. So they got the green light. They go in the railroad tracks, the, the unfinished railroad, to the train station. Right. Perfect, clear path. Yep. They go in that way. Hmm. It's about dark because there's some um, firsthand accounts. Oh, uh, I'm trying to think. One, one of the Confederacy spies, uh, a Union soldier laying on the ground with some shoes or something he wants, goes over there to take it. And the guy says, hey, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know. But it's dusk and dark enough that, you know, he didn't pick up on that. But there's these first thing in the accounts. He's getting in there around dark. It's got to be between 8 and 830, right? Right. By the time they get in there, check in, and now we're going to determine what we're going to do with you. Yule's been reconnoitering that ground, trying to figure out. He, he rides up past, what is it, High Street? Mm-hmm. on Baltimore Street, take a look at for himself. This might be where the famous, you know, name the general who's hit in the leg but suffers no wound, you know. Yule. He gets hit yeah, in the first In the wooden leg. In yeah. the wooden leg, shot in the leg, no wound. Um, but he's trying to figure out what's the best way to get at it. Right. And eventually he's, you know, looking around that Culp's Hill side of it, you know, come in from that direction all the troops, pretty much, that he had engaged have been engaged. They're fatigued. You know, they, they weren't uh, encamped here and rested when they went into battle. Right. They had marched numerous miles to get here and immediately went into battle. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're greatly fatigued. They're disorganized from fighting through the streets and alleys. So the unit cohesions are shot. Um, they're encumbered by a lot of prisoners. Mm-hmm. And you're still trying to house the house, clean this mess up. Um, you're, you've losing daylight. You're looking for fresh troops. He, the, the account is he asked Lee for help from Hill. Yeah. And that's where this whole discussion of Anderson came up is, eh, I don't really want to give you Anderson. Right. You know, don't you have Johnson? Where's Johnson at? Is fresh troops. Uh, and then you have the scouting that goes up Culp's Hill, and they run into the Seventh Indiana guys. Yes, and that kind of throws that's about that puts the, the nails occupied. in the coffin. And yeah. That's got to be around midnight. That he's trying that deep into the night mm-hmm. to try and figure out a way to move Johnson around, get some troops lined up, and occupy that wooded hill in the rear mm-hmm. to make Cemetery Hill untenable. Anyway. Right, right. So that at first light, there's not going to be a battle at, at Gettysburg. We're going to be talking about the Battle of Thurmont or Emmitsburg or Frederick or yes. wherever the decisive battle now right. occurs. Yeah, Pete, uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of maybe newbies or visitors, first time visitors or something uh, to the battlefield, uh, think that Culp's Hill is the main hill, um, but really it's Cemetery Hill. Like Cemetery. That's you take that Culp's Hill's useless. Cemetery Hill's bald, uh, the vegetation, Mm -hmm. it's um, massive. Um, It doesn't come to as sharp of a point. No, it's like a plateau. It's more of a bigger plateau from a defensive position. The military crest is a nice big round, you know, it's got that dominating look. And I always point out to folks, it's the front. Yeah. What defined it as the front? The fighting of July 1st. Yeah. Where did we come from? We came from out here north of town and west of town, and this was the fallback position. This is the main battle front, is Cemetery Hill. Culp's Hill is a flank position to that, and Cemetery Ridge is a flank position to that. Right. People often say, you know, this rift between uh, Major General Meade and Sickles. A lot of people will say, well, we put Sickles in the back mm-hmm. was his intent yeah, yeah. to get you go back there somewhere where you're not gonna you know mess <laughs> the hell out of my way. get away from me yeah not you know thinking that there would be a big fight coming from that direction sure you know kind of a thing but that's the main thing is cemetery hill and we oversimplify it yes but big we, time we, we oversimplify this that you know take that hill if practicable, oh, right. it's Lee's fault for not being more forceful. What if Stonewall Jackson had been here? I think Sue says, eh, he'd have smelled pretty bad because he'd been dead for a you know, month, two months. Um, he smelled pretty bad. 
But um, we like to think, well, if Lee would have said, you must take that hill, the outcome would have been different. Not from what I, I can so. see. Yo, Yo is trying all his efforts to figure out on ground that he does not have a good understanding of how to get troops arrayed in a, such a fashion to make this happen. Right. Don't forget about all the Union gun batteries that are staring down the throat of that street looking down on that town. You're yeah. not coming that direction. Right, right. Okay, that's, you know. And like you pointed out before, form, forming with all those buildings and whatever the hell else there is to get in your way, it's just, it's not a good move it's not a no matter how you slice way it. to come from the town direction. The batteries are all in place. It's a formidable looking thing. Um, so what, what do all these military uh, folks I'm not going at that. I'm going to go around that. And so now it's a, 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 can you attack from the West? Can you send Anderson against the West? Can I get help from that direction? Mm -hmm. If not, you're going around the left. What's the left? What did Culp's Hill come up that direction? Um, and, and so we oversimplify. We like to, it, Yule's the scapegoat of, of the night of July 1st is, well, you didn't take that hill. You know, yeah, that's the blame. Um, but, we don't do Yule justice by doing that. No, and um, I, th I always feel bad for Yule because uh, I remember when I used to take the double-decker bus tour here, and it was before they had guides. Well, I don't know. They might have had guides, but we always seemed to get the one that had the tape. Yeah. Dramatized in stereo. And, um, you know, they, the, the guy would say, uh, you know, uh, at, at you know whatever time of day, uh, Lee issued orders to Yule to take that hill if practicable. If practicable. There's that phrase, if practicable. <laughs> and, you know, Yule would end up not whatever the hell yeah, it was. right? Yeah. But it made it seem like Yule just goes, nah, it's really not practical. But, like, <laughs> let, like okay, so we're talking about Johnson's division. They're... They're stuck in traffic. They get there around dark. Yep. Um, then you got to figure out what to do with them. Uh, Yule's also getting reports of Union troops on his left. Correct. Yeah, yeah. coming coming in the Hanover Road. Right? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, if he's to engage his or, or uh, commit his men to cemetery or, or well cemetery and or Culp's Hill, their backs now are to the Hanover Road, and so whatever force that is threatens his rear. Right. Um, also, there's no cavalry, so who's going to watch that road? He's got to use infantry to watch that road. That's right. Right. Okay. So, uh, so the, his two divisions that he used early and Rhodes are, you know, look, just because they won doesn't mean they're not tired. It doesn't mean they didn't fight hard. They had losses. Yeah, and they had losses, and they're scattered. Right. Right. They're they're capturing Yankees. Right. Uh, if they're just you know busting through town they're being broken up by all the houses and the streets and everything like that it's going to take a while to uh, recollect them yeah so um i i think you'll made the right oh and then you know as you mentioned the seventh indiana's up there he just knows there's troops up there he doesn't know how many troops are up there yeah well, and he just knows he's not in any position to be uh, messing around right and, and he moves johnson out of the town swings them around uh, the those that know the field benner's hill yeah so over at Benner's Hill and the the uh, Daniel Lady Farm um, mm -hmm. is Union troops were coming in that road. Right. Union troops don't know the situation at Gettysburg. Right. That was their natural approach route. That wasn't necessary. That's not a false report. Right. Right. But they don't know any better than you do exactly. where they're at. Exactly. Okay. Because I've often thought, holy cow, if the Union Army could have actually fortified in some way over there you take <laughs> that whole side of this battlefield story away yeah yeah because as you say you can't turn your backs to no you know the the uh, 12th corps or it wasn't the 12th corps it was the um, no it was it was Fifth, williams okay. division yeah williams division yeah. of the 12th corps coming in that direction yeah. yeah so those weren't false reports and as you said that's one of the reasons that i had on there was that distraction mm-hmm it, it, does it end up being anything more than that? Not really. But that distraction, that fear of these multiple reports is that we may have an enemy coming down on our flank or behind us here. Right. And we need to be cautious of what we're doing. But Johnson gets moved out there in the dark to be prepared 
Sure. For an assault on Cul- on Culp Cell. Right. He's making the, the he, arrangements. He's getting it, yeah. He's yeah. getting him in position that, hey, let's make preparations. You're going to assault that, that hill, you know, down through there. And when the um, the advance reconnaissance comes back and half of them are captured and mm. were, were mm. under fire in the dark, as you said, what's that mean? Right. That means there's probably numerous regiments up there, a couple, two, three brigades, whatever it is. It wasn't just a regiment in their mind's eye. Exactly. Is that place is held. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, our buddy Bill Etzkorn says, I have always been fascinated by the amount of officers that were arrested during the campaign. I've never heard of an account of anything malicious, but somehow walking in a creek is something to be arrested for. <laughs> yeah, there's there there are uh, some uh, a good number of stories about arrests in, uh, in uh, the, 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 that I'm aware of in the Union Army. I'm not totally sure of how many there were in the Confederate Army. I don't know if they could afford to be arresting people. All right. No famous arrests in well, the Confederate Army. Yeah, and I mean, I'm trying to think if That's I've ever heard of Jackson's any. Jackson's not here. <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> Joe, right? Yeah. Joe, right? You, you, I, I always point hmm. out to people, Yule's best line on his resume, never arrested by Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Is... He can get along yeah. with anybody. Right? Yeah, that's right. He was a good. He was a good guy for Jackson because he did. He didn't get caught up in. I need to know more. And right. Fighting with Jackson about it. He was a good guy for. I'll tell you what you need to know when you need to know it, and I'll tell you what you need to do, mm-hmm. and you would go get it done. And right. That's one of the things people point out uh, of Lee's leadership style is when he tells Yule take that hill if practicable. That's discretionary and vague. Right, and Yule doesn't like to operate in those, right. that kind of a space. That's right. another. That's another point too. Yeah, yeah. yeah is uh, um, uh, what, what were we talking about? Who, who uh, we were talking a, about arrests. Who got arrested in the creek, Bill? I love you. Who got arrested in the creek? Uh, I, I don't know what he's I, referring to there. I, I, Okay. Is he referring to the the Vermont uh, I, stopping for water? Yeah, no. So that's what I was thinking. It's, it's got to be stopping for water. Stopping for water, but the, he's very specific. But somehow walking in a creek is something to be arrested for. I don't know. I mean, it, it, there's, it, there's a million stories. It's, and it's I know an Bill is I stop for water. It's got to be, you know, and and that's where you get arrested and told to uh, march in the rear. Now tell tell that story though, because that's when you look uh, at the Vermont monument. Um, is it the? Ver- yeah, he's yeah. got the hatchet. Yes, go ahead, tell yeah. the story. I, I, no, well, no, I'm going to blow it because I don't know the well, guy's just, name. Well, you don't have to go with yeah, the yeah, details, so I, I just remember, the gist of it. can't remember the guy's name. He but, allowed his men to stop for water, right? That's right. And when he I had like orders to say is, You know what, the military's pretty militant about orders. <laughs> you know, you follow orders. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, how did uh, uh, Colonel Jessup say it in A Few Good Men? Or people die. Yeah. Right? We give orders. We are supposed to make pace. We're supposed to be somewhere at a certain time. And when we say there's no stopping, there's no stopping. Right. Uh, and then the humanitarian part of it kicks in. To, we're, we're, these are real people. And right. the closer you get to the real people, the more you care about your people. These are my boys. They're suffering. Yes. And you know what? And, and we praise Chamberlain's whole story of convincing the second Maine boys to join up with the 20th Maine. Mm-hmm. But he related to them. He met their needs, you know, and, and the, the movie's a great account of that, is he feeds them, he cares for them, he tells you, I'm not going to kill you. Somebody else might, right. but you'll be safe with me, yeah. right? You, you get that bond. Daddy's got you. Is when, the lower level you go, you're looking out for your people, right. for your guys, right. okay? And if that means we, we can make a better pace, if you're not tongue's not sticking to the roof of your mouth and you need a little bit of water i'm going to detail a few people to fill canteens then i'm going to take it upon myself and to heck with the the uh, you know um, the order. strict uh, orders they get caught and you pay the price right. okay um you know you're arrested and march in the rear and um it's always funny, and you know Jackson would do this too. Even when Lee had to talk him out of it, is when it comes down to a fight, you're back in the ranks. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> you might yeah. go in with a hatchet but instead of your sword. But what's the, so? What's the hatchet? So, so this officer of the Vermont Regiment that allowed his men to stop to get water was arrested, and, and as an officer, if you're arrested, you lose your 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 sword, your authority, mm-hmm. and part of that is. Give me your sword. Your symbol of authority. That's correct. Mm. So now you don't have that. There's got to be some embarrassment to this. Sure. Okay. And that's why you march in the rear is you're, you're coming along, but 
there's an embarrassment to it uh, and that whole thing. And so even when he's restored to his authority, his way of thumbing his nose at it is, oh, yeah, well, I'll just go instead of a sword, I'll go with a camp hatchet. <laughs> It's, I love that style. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so much so that they were so uh, the uh, um, the position of the commanders. That's why there's a hatchet laying right beside his foot on yeah. that monument yeah. right there on Hancock Avenue. Is that whole story, and um, that's a great human interest story. But that's got to be you know walking in the creek is there's a human side of it. Yeah. And people wanting to get somebody what they need, which is a drink of water. But that's also a good lesson for people who, you know, hear these stories um, about, you know, the battle and, and they go, well, why didn't they just whip around that way? And why didn't they just do this simple thing mm-hmm. in my mind? But, you know. Armies are made of men, and back then, men, you know, we didn't have these big trucks transporting people around. You walked, unless you were in the cavalry. But even then, you had to get off and walk once in a while. You had to worry about your horse. You had to worry about the horse. And so, instead of gasoline, you had you needed water and food for all these things, uh, people and horses. According to the Google machine... Yeah, you it don't need is, that? It is Lieutenant Stephen F. Brown, Company K of the 13th Vermont. Stephen F. Brown, that's him. Yeah. Okay. And, and So, I have a poem... Like the only poem my dad ever made me learn was Gunga Din by <laughs> Rudyard Kipling. If you're familiar with that, and it starts out, you, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going go to ahead, go for uh, it. You can talk of gin and beer when you're quartered safe out here and sent to penny fights and Alder shot it. But when it comes to slaughter, you'll do your work on water and you'll lick the blooming boots of him that's got it. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Got to yeah. have that water. Woo. Nothing worse than being thirsty. I'll take being hungry over thirsty any day. Yep. No um, doubt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I forgot what I was saying, but that was a good. I like that. So you actually had a memorized Gunga Din. I, I can do the whole thing. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gunga Din. Well, I, uh, we don't have time for that today, but maybe another day we can have you uh, <laughs> recite Gunga Din for us. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, that's it. We've come to the last question and the end of the show. Uh, Jason, thank you very much for coming on. Thank it was you. a lot of fun having you. you. Anytime you want to come back, we can talk about whatever the hell you want to talk about. Yeah, let's do that. All right, good. All right. And uh, Joey, great job over there. Thank you. Wonderful uh, filling in for Eric there. And uh yeah. In case, I don't know what order this is coming out in, but uh, in case uh, those of you uh, listening out there don't listen to our live show every Friday on YouTube, AG Today, uh, Eric, uh, the producer, has uh, left the show. He he has moved far away. It's not any kind of bad blood or anything. We're still uh, great uh, friends, but uh, he just, you know, he has to move on with his life. He wants bigger and better things, and we wish him all the best, and we thank him for his service to addressing Gettysburg and to you. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's it. We will continue. We will survive. Hmm. At first, I was afraid. Yeah. I was petrified. Kept thinking, I can't continue to do this show without him by my side. But then, uh, you know, I got a good group of people around me, and a lot of people have offered to help, and and Joe is one of them, and Joe did a fine job tonight, so we thank you very much for that, Joe. Good job. Very good. Uh, Thank you. Very good. And uh, that is it for us, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, like I always tell you, if uh, you liked what you heard today and you'd like to take a tour with Jason, shoot me an email, matt at addressinggettysburg.com, and I'll put you guys in touch. Uh, Otherwise, that's it. I hope you're doing well. Take care of yourselves, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye now. All right. That's it. Need a core badge or other insignia for your uniform? Then check out the badge maker. Here's what some of his satisfied customers had to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe and it's fantastic. He hand stamped it exactly as I wanted. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him in the past quality badges and good service. And Jerry S. says, The Badge Maker is the go-to place for accurate replica Civil War badges. So go to CivilWarCoreBadges.com and attach a message with your order saying you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Our hearts of scout have got a stain, for soon tis known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down, and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man forget shall go to jail from Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down.